So, ladies and gentlemen, chapter 13, okay, is all about solutions, and a good part of this chapter will be review from Chem 1, which is always nice. And not that it really matters to you, but this lesson is my favorite lesson of the whole year, okay? There's just, there's a lot of real world application in this chapter. There's just cool stuff that like maybe you, you've observed in your everyday life, but you didn't really know why that happened that way. There's just, there's good stuff in here, all right? good times. We're going to have some stories. You'll love it. All right. So can you guys tell me before we, you know, get into the nitty gritty here, the word solution, there's another way to say that. Can you think of another term that means the same thing as the word solution? Okay. Aqueous is a type of solution, you're right, yeah. Okay, a mixture, but what type, to be specific? Homogeneous, okay? Homogeneous mixture. The word solution implies homogeneous mixture, okay? So something dissolved in something else, evenly mixed, uniform composition, Okay. So we're going to use the word solution instead of homogeneous mixture, which takes too long to say. And let's just review some other vocabulary. If we'll just use we'll use this example a lot today. If I am dissolving table salt in water, the table salt is the what? Solute water is the solvent. solvent. Okay, very good. Now, in all honesty, guys, most of the time, we're going to be talking about a solid solute being dissolved in a liquid. But I want you guys to be aware that you can have any phase of matter, solid, liquid, or gas, dissolved in any other phase of matter. I mean, for example, what's an example in our everyday lives of a gas dissolved in a liquid. Soda, yeah. Anything carbonated, what is the gas that's dissolved? CO2, carbon dioxide, okay. Um, here's another one that I just think is really cool. Can you think of an example of a solid dissolved in a gas? It's kind of weird. Solid dissolved in a gas. Smoke, right? Smoke is very, very small, teeny tiny, minute ash particles, which is really just pure carbon, dissolved in air. That's what smoke is, all right? So you can talk about all phases we are primarily, though, going to focus on aqueous solutions. And what does that mean, aqueous? Water is the solvent. OK, good. So these concepts you discussed in Chem 1, we're going to go into a little bit of detail of what is physically happening when you dissolve something in something else. Okay. And should you ever see this, this variable? Okay, we know what delta H is, the change in heat. Do you know what S-O-L-N? Solution. Solution. The heat change associated when you create a solution. And you may not be aware of it, but some things, when they are dissolved, will release a lot of heat and it would feel warm to your hands. Other solutions when they're made? would feel cold to your hands. Some are endo, some are exo. Whether it's endo or exo is determined by three steps. The process of dissolving something in something else occurs in 
three steps. Step one, expanding the solute. Now, I'm not really crazy about that word, expanding. I wish I had chosen a different word because this is too gentle, okay? If I'm dissolving table salt in water, the table salt doesn't just expand, okay? It's really like the solute is completely being pulled apart, like demolishing the solute would be more appropriate. That step will always be endothermic. We'll talk in just a few minutes about why that is. So busting apart the solute. Step two is expanding the solvent. Now I do like that I chose that word because think about it for a second, guys. If we're putting salt water, excuse me, table salt in water. The water particles have to expand a little bit. They have to move away from each other to allow room for those solute particles to be added. Again, always an endothermic process. We'll talk about why in just a minute. Step three is probably the most important one though. Okay. The third step is how do the solute and solvent interact with one another? Okay. Are they very attracted to one another? Are they repelling each other? That is gonna be endo or exo. It depends upon their interaction. Okay. So we're not doing any math with this, but if you were to have the heat values associated with all three steps, you could add them together to get the total heat of solution. Now, we're not doing the math with that. We are purely concept here. But let's talk about that third step, because that is really the important one. How do the solute and solvent interact? Are you familiar with this phrase? Like dissolves like. You may have heard it, you may not. What does it mean? Okay. Polar solvents dissolve polar solutes. Nonpolar solvents dissolve nonpolar solutes. Like dissolves like. Make a note to yourself. When we say polar sol solvents dissolve polar solutes, you can also include in that category ionic solutes. Okay. Water, for example, is a polar solvent. It'll dissolve polar solutes. It will also dissolve most ionic compounds. Okay. Now, let's think about a nonpolar solvent, like oil, for example. Okay, remember a couple of classes ago we talked about how things like oil and fat, they're very nonpolar substances. What do you think is gonna happen if I try to put table salt in oil? Will it dissolve? It will not, okay? Like dissolves like. Table salt is ionic, oil is a nonpolar solvent, it's not gonna happen. Now, if I had a nonpolar solute, like, and I'll use my own experience, I'm from the South and in the South, Southern cooking, ooh. Southern cooking involves a lot of use of lard. Do you know what lard is? Animal fat. Let me tell you, you can buy huge tubs of it, and people that are like really into authentic Southern cooking, they use it in pretty much everything. And in all honesty, it makes everything taste better, but it is disgusting, okay? As long as I don't have to see it being made, I'll try that fried chicken that was cooked with lard, sure. I just don't wanna see it, okay? 
But if I had a pan of oil on the stove and I took chunks of lard, which is nonpolar, and threw it into my pan, it would dissolve beautifully. Mm -hmm. Okay? <laughs> yum, yum. All right? Yeah, when you go to restaurants and you're, you know, it's kind of a southern cooking kind of place and you get a biscuit and you think, man, this is like the best biscuit I've ever had. You know why? It was cooked with lard, that's why. Mm -mm. Okay. Now, this says if the heat of solution is large and negative, meaning very, very negative. And then it says, go. Let me explain what I mean by that. What does it mean for delta H to be negative? What does that even mean? It's exothermic. Are most exothermic processes, do they happen on their own or not? Most of them? Yeah, they do. Okay. So if you come across a situation where the heat of solution is very, very exothermic, when I say go, what I mean is that solution will form. Whatever is being dissolved will dissolve. Okay. If the heat of solution is very, very positive, meaning endothermic, no go means no, that's not going to dissolve. That table salt is not going to dissolve in the oil that you have on the stove. It's not going to happen. If your heat of solution is positive endo, but small. Now I know what you're thinking. Well, how small is small? Like what kind of a number? I'll, I'll get to that. If the heat of solution is endo, but barely you probably will still get the dissolving process to happen because of this. What does that word mean? Messiness, chaos, disorder. Think about it, guys. Which situation is messier? Salt and water separated or salt and water mixed together? Mixed together. The, the having solute and solvent mixed together is more disordered and the universe likes that. So even if delta H is positive but not very positive, you usually will get the solution to form because it's, I don't even know if this is a word, entropically favored. I just made that up, I don't know. Okay. Now, please don't worry about like how small is a small number? I'm never gonna give you just one number and say, okay, will this dissolve or not? No, I would give you heats of solution to compare. Like this heat of solution is two joules. This heat of solution is 50,000 joules this one is more likely to happen than that one. Okay. So I might ask you to compare. I'm not gonna just give you a single number. Okay. Let's talk about those three steps. How solutions form from a visual perspective. And guys, this is really important that you understand the process of dissolving and what it would actually look like. Okay, so the example on this, this graphic here is table salt in water. We're gonna use that example a lot today. And let's review those three steps. Go back and look at your notes. When something dissolves in something else, what's the first step? I like that you use that word, demolishing the solute, okay? breaking it apart. The example here is NaCl. What would I be breaking to bust up this crystal? What kind of bonds? What kind of bonds? Ionic. 
ionic, NaCl, that's an ionic compound. I'm breaking ionic bonds. Do you think that requires energy? Yeah, like a lot, okay? This is definitely endothermic. Now what if, I know this isn't on that picture, but what if this is my solute? What's the name of that compound? Ammonia. Ammonia. It's not ionic, it's covalent. Would this dissolve in water, yes or no? Yes. How do you know that? You're right, it will. It's polar, okay? So it will dissolve, like dissolves like, but if I was going to demolish, break apart this solute, be careful how you answer, what would I be breaking in this example? This is my solute, not covalent bonds. Oh, oh. Well, let's be more general, intermolecular forces. Guys, that is a hard thing for people to keep straight. If your solute is ionic, what are you breaking? You're breaking ionic bonds. If your solute is covalent, what you would be breaking is not covalent bonds. It would be the intermolecular forces between these two molecules. Does that require energy to pull these two apart? Nod your heads. Yes, endothermic. No matter what kind of solute it is, that first step is always endothermic. What's step two of the process? What happens? Expand the solvent. Okay, well, our solvent here is water. What are we breaking to pull two water molecules away from them, each other? Yeah, well, intermolecular forces. Does that require energy? Yeah, sure does. That's endothermic. What if my solvent was oil? What are you breaking to pull two oil particles away from each other? Intermolecular forces, London dispersion forces, because it's just nonpolar. Okay. Third step, the most important one. How do the solute and solvent interact? Look at this side of the picture. Why is it that this cation, the sodium, positively charged sodium ion, why is it being surrounded by water, but specifically, why is the oxygen side of the water facing it? Okay. Hot water is a polar molecule, yes? Okay. Oxygen is the more electronegative element, meaning the electrons kind of congregate on this side of the molecule, the oxygen side is a little bit more negative. So these sides are all negative. They are attracted to that cation. And look at the bottom picture, it's the opposite. The positive side of the water is attracted to this chlorine anion, okay? And guys, that's what happens. Around each ion, you get like a cage of water molecules, okay? And I have seen AP questions on free response in the past where they have asked you to draw this. Not explain it, draw it, which is why I put this here, so that you have a visual understanding of this. Does this make sense to you? No? Yes? Okay. Very good. Okay, so what determines something's solubility is ultimately its structure. Okay, we've been talking about structure a lot. All right? We've already, we've already talked about this. The example that I'm going to give you 
on how structure affects function is to talk about soap. And this is fascinating, people. I wrote an entire term paper in college on soap. You will never wash your hands the same way again. Okay? So think about it for a second about what is my understanding of soap right now, and then I'm going to blow your minds. Are you ready? You might want to hold on to something. All right. Here's the deal. It doesn't matter what kind of soap we're talking about. Hand soap, laundry detergent, dishwasher soap, bar soap, toothpaste even, which is basically just soap. They all have the same general structure. Soap molecules. Oh, just wait. There is more dazzling to come. All soap molecules have the same general structure. It's like there's a head region and then these long tail regions, okay, carbon tails. And I want you to think, even though, yes, the head and the tail are connected to each other, I want you to think of them as sort of different parts, like separate entities. This tail region is very nonpolar. Okay. This may be a new word for you. It's a great vocabulary word. What is the prefix hydro? Water? Phobic? Phobia? Fearing. Water fearing. Why would the tail fear water? Water's polar, right? This guy is nonpolar. They don't like each other. They don't like to interact with each other. The head region, however, do you see that there's negative charges on the head? The head region is polar, hydrophilic, water loving. So soap is a really interesting molecule because it has two, two areas to it, some that are water loving, some that are water fearing, okay? So soap kind of looks like this. It kind of looks like a sperm. Come on, somebody was thinking it, let's be honest. All right. So hypothetical situation, and by the way, the graphics in this chapter are just amazing, right? Okay, I'll explain what that is. Let's say you're helping to make dinner and sorry vegetarians but you are working with meat of some kind maybe you're cutting up chicken or you are mixing things into ground hamburger meat or you're marinating steaks whatever for those of you that have ever cooked with meat your hands feel really greasy after why is that what's on your hands now the fat yeah, fat from the meat. So you're a responsible cook. You're, gonna, you don't, you're not going to leave your hands like that and start handling other food. So you go over to the sink. But if you just take your hands that have all this fat all over it and just put it in the water, it's not going to do anything. Your hands are still greasy. So what do you do? You go over to the soap. You sing happy birthday twice like the little poster in the kid's bathroom tells you to do. Yeah, that's how long you should lather your hands in case you don't know that. See, we've all learned something today. Okay? And then you take your hands and you put it under the water and like magic, your hands are clean and they don't feel greasy anymore. That's very strange. Well, this beautiful graphic here is a big droplet of fat on your hand, okay? Or a grease, whatever, which is very nonpolar, okay? Fats are nonpolar, water's polar, we've got a problem here, okay? So here's what happens. This is the prepare to be dazzled moment. <clears throat> this is what happens, okay? And this is where that whole thing, it looks kind of like sperm thing comes back into play. Like this is the sperm, this is the egg, although this is sort of backwards, right? Doesn't the sperm go head first 
Yeah. Well, soap goes tail first. Now, what you end up getting is the tails of the soap sort of wiggle their way in there, okay? Now, why would these tails like to be in the fat? Yeah, it's two non-polar things. They like each other. The head region wants no part of that because it's polar, hydrophilic. And what you get is when you're doing your lather and you're singing happy birthday twice, your hands become coated with this. Water, fat droplets that are coated on the outside with these little soap heads. Do the soap heads like water, yes or no? Yes, so then what do you do? You take your hands and you put them in the water. The water is attracted to these heads and whoosh, it whisks it away and down the drain. I mean, it's amazing. You will never wash your hands the same way again, okay? Tell this one over the dinner table tonight. Your family will love it, all right? But the point is, structure determines function. Because soap molecules have this unique structure, they can be used in all kinds of ways, all right? If you are a person that likes to bake, you'll sometimes see the term an emulsifier. Eggs are an emulsifier. Egg, some of the, um, some molecules within an egg have a very similar structure. The reason you add eggs when you're baking or cooking things is so that you can bond together things that are nonpolar, like oil, and things that are polar, like water. When you bake a cake, it has oil in it. Most cake recipes have you add oil. Most cake recipes have you add water. If you didn't add egg, you're never gonna get a mix. But when you add an emulsifier, like eggs, it allows everything to be blended together. Amazing, right? Okay? All right, let's talk about solubility. I mean, these graphics are just amazing. Okay. Now, when we talk about something being dissolved in something else, I haven't said the word pressure at all today, but I'm going to talk about it now. If you are trying to dissolve, let's say, sugar, a solid, in water, does sugar dissolve in water, first of all? Yeah, it does. The pressure of the room makes no difference. It has zero effect on how much sugar will dissolve in water. It's a solid solute. Solid and liquid solutes Pressure has no effect. Gases, however, are affected by the pressure of the environment. Okay? And what was the example we said earlier? Everyday example of a gas dissolved in a liquid? Soda. Okay? If you have not noticed, soda bottles or any kind of anything that has contains a <clears throat> dissolved gas you'll very often see somewhere on the label it'll say contents bottled under pressure have you ever seen that okay well let's say you work at the coca-cola bottling company and you are producing hundreds of thousands maybe millions of bo two liter bottles of coke in your factory you want your Coke to be as carbonated as possible, right? Because that's what the customer expects. What's the opposite of a carbonated drink? If it's lost all its carbonation, it's, it's flat, okay? Does anyone want to drink a flat Coke? No. Maybe some people, but mostly no. 
the point is, you as the bottler want to bottle that Coke under high pressure because the greater the pressure above the surface of that solution, the greater amount of dissolved gas you will get. You want your Coke to be as carbonated, as bubbly as possible, so you're going to bottle it under high pressure. You are literally pushing more CO2 into that Coke. Now let's, let's look at it the other way around. What happens when you open a brand new bottle of soda? What is that sound? What's, what, what's happening? Gas is escaping. What gas? Carbon dioxide. All right, well, let's think about why that's happening. When you open that bottle that was bottled under high pressure, what are you doing to the pressure? You're lowering it. The opposite works too. If the pressure is lowered, decreased, there will be less dissolved gas. That CO2 that was dissolved under high pressure, some of it, because I lowered the pressure, is going to escape out. And it literally comes out of the bottle and makes a noise. Okay. This relationship is something called Henry's Law. Okay, We're not doing any math with it. You don't even need to write that equation down if you don't want. All I care about is that you know this relationship. If you increase the pressure above the solution, you will increase the concentration of dissolved gas. It's a direct relationship. So pressure has no effect on solid and liquid solutes. It does affect gaseous solutes. We've talked about pressure. Let's talk about temperature. Okay. You are a tea drinker and you have two cups of tea, equal volume. One is hot tea, one is iced tea. And you like sugar in your tea. Which cup of tea can you put more sugar in? Hot tea, okay? As temperature goes up, most solid solutes, ignore this guy, solid solutes, their solubility increases. The amount you can dissolve increases, okay? As temperature goes up, your solvent particles move apart from each other a little bit, it allows more room for solute particles to get in there. So if you like really, really sweet tea or sweet coffee, you should drink it as hot as you can stand it, okay? Because you can get more sugar in there, okay? And by the way, what would happen if you had a very, saturated sample of hot tea, meaning you have loaded it up with sugar. You've added as much as you possibly can. It is saturated. And then you take that hot tea and you put it in the refrigerator and it starts to cool down. What are you going to find four hours later when you come back and get it? You're going to find a big layer of sugar piled up at the bottom of your cup because colder tea can't hold as much sugar. Okay. Now gases, it's the opposite. Real world life experience here, okay? Middle of summer, it's incredibly hot. And let me tell you, those companies like Coke and Pepsi, they are geniuses when it comes to what kind of artwork they put on those vending machines. They know what they're doing, okay? It's July, it's like a thousand degrees outside. And they've got that on the vending machines, it's like 
there's ice all over the place and there's a nice bottle of coke like nestled in the ice and they know what they're doing because I'm like that sucker that goes by the vending machine and I'm like yeah that looks really good right now I think I'm gonna buy one yeah okay and I buy one okay and I enjoy part of it but then I'm out running errands and I leave it in the car in the middle of July windows up in the parking lot while I go into Target and I run my errands. And now my beautiful ice cold Coke is cooking in the car. And the temperature's going up. And it's going up a lot. And I come back and I get in the car and I want to enjoy my ice cold Coke, which is not ice cold anymore. Look at what happens to the amount of dissolved gas. That Coke is not gonna be carbonated anymore. What was the word we used? It's gonna be flat because the higher the temperature, the less gas can be dissolved. Okay. The higher the temperature, the more energy these particles have, and it causes the gaseous, the dissolved gas to literally escape out of solution. And I'm all sad because my delicious ice cold Coke is now hot and flat for me. Okay, but there's some real world stuff to talk about here. Okay, and here is one of them. Okay, so I'm going to tell you two stories. One is a personal story and one is not. So get comfortable, story time. Okay, for any of you that are outdoorsy kind of people, like you like to hike and go canoeing and things like that, if you go up the Potomac River, like far north of Great Falls. You don't want to be in a canoe on Great Falls. That's a, that's a bad idea. Okay. If you go far enough north up the Potomac River, the Potomac River gets to be much more narrow, a much quieter, calm, canoeable, that's not a word, canoeable river. Okay. And one of my friends, she and I took a, a little day trip and we're canoeing down the river. So think geography here. We're canoeing south. Maryland is on my left side. Virginia is on my right side. You with me? Okay. So we're canoeing along. And it's about April. So we're coming out of winter. The water's pretty cold. Like, I didn't want to get in it. It's pretty cold. But we're canoeing along, and we see on the left-hand side, so on the Maryland side, a nuclear power plant. Not a big deal. Nuclear power plants are usually situated on the banks of a flowing body of water, okay? Because they pull water from this river and run it through their cooling towers to keep the temperature of their nuclear reactors under control. And then they take that water that's run through the cooling tower and they put it right back in the river. Now, that water hasn't come in contact with any kind of nuclear material or anything, but, and this is what my friend said, we're canoeing along, and she says, put your hand in the water, okay? And I put my hand in the water, and the water was the temperature of water that you would use to like take a bath with. It's hot, which is weird, okay? The temperature of a river should not be hot, especially not in April. And we realized that it, the reason was is because this power plant was putting back this now much warmer water back into the river. Okay, well, big deal. Who cares? How do fish breathe? Dissolved oxygen. That's a gas, right? Okay, well, if you raise the temperature what happens to the amount of that dissolved gas? It's much less, like down to close to nothing. <clears throat> Fish don't have any oxygen to breathe. And I mean, it was almost like there was a line across the river. Like we're canoeing and it looks very nice and everything's fine. And then we basically cross this one point and all of a sudden we see fish carcasses all over the surface of the water because they can't breathe so they die. Thermal pollution is not chemical pollution. It's 
raising the temperature of bodies of water, which kills aquatic life. And this is one reason why some people are very against nuclear power plants, because that has to happen. Okay? Now, nuclear power plants have other very positive things, but sometimes you have to weigh the pros and cons. Okay. Story number two, not a personal story, thank goodness. Um, there is a lake, it's called Lake Nios, and it's in the country of Cameroon in Africa. And maybe you may have heard this story before. I saw it on the National Geographic channel, fascinating channel. And there was this village of people that live around the lake, and one day, every single villager just dropped dead, all of them. Like in a matter of minutes, whatever they were doing, just dropped dead. Young, old, men, women, everybody. And so they brought these researchers in to figure out, you know, how does an entire village of people just drop dead? I mean, there's, there's no, nobody has, you know, any signs of injury. There's no bomb that went off. And what they notice is the lake, there's something strange about the lake. Okay, now think about what lakes look like. Lakes are very calm, serene. This lake was bubbling like a hot tub. That's weird. Lakes are not supposed to do that. And what they found was that this, in this very, very deep lake, at the bottom of the lake, and I think I'm using the right word here, there was a, a fissure, like a crack in the Earth's crust. I don't know if that's the right word. And this crack was releasing carbon dioxide gas. Well, for those of you that have ever been deep sea diving or scuba diving, what happens to the pressure as you go deep down underwater? It increases pretty dramatically. So at the bottom of this lake, it's very high pressure. Now, look at your notes. Henry's Law, high pressure. Does that favor a lot of dissolved gas or a little? A lot. So any CO2 that was bubbling out of this fissure immediately dissolved. Plus it's very cold at the bottom of the lake. So that also facilitated dissolving. Okay, fine. Well, guys, what happens when you shake up a bottle of soda? It explodes. Well, what is an exploding bottle of soda really? Like what's what is that? What's happening? What's, what is all of this foam? What is all of this that's erupting? CO2. Like all of the CO2 coming out all at once. How do you shake a lake? Earthquake. There was an earthquake which shook up the lake that had all this dissolved CO2 in it, agitation causes these, this dissolved gas to erupt. All of the CO2 comes out in this big rush, and CO2 is heavier than air, so it comes out and then settles down and suffocated everybody within minutes. It's terrible. It's a freak accident. I mean, it's just, it's, it's terrible, but that's what happened, okay? I don't mean to depress you or anything, but the perfect example of temperature and pressure and solubility and the whole thing. Let's move on, shall we? Let's move on to happier topics. Do you have a calculator out? Good, because you're going to need it. Let's talk about the math, the only math in this chapter, which is how do you calculate, how do you put a number on how concentrated something is? Well, there's different ways. We've used all three of these before, so this should be review, okay? This is the most common, this is the one we'll use the most often, just to refresh your memory. Moles of solute divided by liters of solution, or total volume, if you wish, in liters. Okay? 
mass percentage, mass of solute over total mass, mass of the whole solution, times 100. Or you could use mole fraction. Usually, this is going to be moles of your solute over total moles. Just to make sure you remember this, look at this last one here. What are the units? When you calculate a mole fraction, what are the units for mole fraction? No units. Moles cancel. This has no units. One other thing I want to remind you of, this word right here is a bit of a misnomer. When you are asked to calculate a mole fraction, ladies and gentlemen, please don't express your answer as a fraction. Divide it out. Give me a decimal. So I have some practice problems here, but before you even read these problems, I want to offer you a suggestion. Okay. Number one is very easy, Chem 1 level. Honestly, this is just to kind of warm up your brains. Number two is more like what you will see. Here is my suggestion. What you're being asked to do, you're being given in this particular problem a mass percentage, and you're being asked to convert it to other types of concentrations. My suggestion is whatever you're given, in this case a percentage, don't leave it like that. Express it as a fraction. Like instead of 38%, write it like this. 38 grams of solute, which in this case is HCl, for every 100 grams of the whole solution. If they gave you a molarity, for example, Okay. And this is a ridiculous number, but let's say they gave you a molarity of 38 molar. Don't leave it like that. Rewrite it like this. 38 moles of HCl per what? What would I do here? How many liters? One. If they gave me a mole fraction, not 38, let's say it was 0.38, I would write it like this. Okay. Breaking it into pieces, I think, makes it a little easier, but that's, that's just me. You don't have to do that. So try number one. Number one shouldn't be a problem. See if you can figure out number two. Okay. So check your answers for number one, but let me give you a little assistance with number two, okay? Number two gave us a mass percentage, 38%, which I suggested you rewrite like a fraction. Think about what you're supposed to solve for as a fraction as well. It says change 38%. The first thing it asks you to solve for is a molarity. Well, guys, what's in the numerator of a molarity? Moles. In this case, moles of HCl. And what would be in the denominator? Leaders of the whole solution. Okay, well let's let's go back to the problem here. Look at these pieces you have to work with. You have grams of HCl. Can you get to moles of HCl? Yeah, just use your periodic table. You have 
grams of the whole solution, you need a volume of the whole solution. What can you use in number two to get you from a mass to a volume? The density. Now you will have to be careful with the units. With this density and that mass, when you solve for volume, it's going to come out in cubic centimeters. What is that the same unit as? Milliliters. Which you can then change to liters. You can do this. Keep going. Okay, so, guys, as I said, number one was a really pretty easy one. That was kind of a warm up. This is more what you'll be asked to do. Okay. Let's wrap this chapter up, ladies and gentlemen. There is one final topic, which I think you cover in Chem 1. There's no math associated with it. It's called colligative properties, okay? And it says addition of a non-volatile solute. Now, that's a word we've heard before. What is the word volatile mean in chemistry? Maybe explosive, but why is it an explosive liquid? Why? High vapor pressure, yeah. And what causes that? It evaporates very easily. So non-volatile means doesn't evaporate easily. And in all honesty, guys, when you see this term non-volatile solute, it could be a liquid, but chances are they're talking about a solid solute. Okay. But the point is, if you add a non-volatile solute to a solvent, the properties of that solvent change. Like this. What is the boiling point of pure water? 100 degrees. The boiling point of salt water isn't 100. Maybe it's 103. What else could happen? We'll talk about that in a second. The freezing point drops. What's the freezing point of pure water? Zero degrees. The freezing point of salt water might be negative seven. This is why we put salt on icy roads. Okay? Think about it for a second. Let's imagine the temperature outside is exactly zero degrees. Will there be ice on the roads? Yes. Now, there will also be some liquid water. There'll be both, but the roads will be icy. The trucks come along, they throw the salt down on the roads. The salt mixes in with the water, forms a solution, salt water. And if salt water doesn't freeze until it hits negative seven, if it's zero outside, you're not gonna have ice on the roads anymore because it needs to be colder than that in order to freeze, so that's why they do that. Let's talk about these first two bullets, though. It's easier explained with a picture. The picture on the left here, this is pure water, let's say, pure solvent. The little red particles are salt particles, solute. If you would please count for me how many particles in this picture are in the gas phase. Eleven. Okay. Pure water. Salt water. How many particles are in the gas phase on the picture on the right? Eight. There's less gas. Solute particles form what's almost like it's almost like a screen on the surface of the water. Can something can water get through a screen? Yeah. But it's a little bit more difficult. You can't get through it as easily as when there was no screen. In order for water to 
vaporized, these solute particles have made it more difficult. There's less gas. So heating to 100 degrees, let's say, isn't enough heat to get this to boil. I have to add a little bit more heat. I have to raise the temperature higher to get this to finally boil. Okay? It lowers the vapor pressure. There's 11 vapor particles in this picture. There's only eight. Less gas, less vapor pressure. Okay? And really, the take-home message here is solute particles just get in the way. That's all they do. They just get in the way and make the vaporization process, make the freezing process more difficult. Okay? Now, what kinds of questions could you be asked? Maybe you'll be asked something like this. Now, before you read this, I want to explain to you what the word colligative means. Oops, let me change color. A colligative property is a property that is affected not by what solute is being dissolved, but is affected by how many solute particles are there. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, like, say that's my solute. When this solute falls apart, how many pieces does it fall apart into? Two pieces. What if this was my solute? How many ions would this fall apart into? How many? Four. Three lithium ions and one phosphate ion. That's four total pieces. Okay, what about like this guy? How many pieces would he fall apart into? Five. So the take home message here is the more particles of solute you have, the bigger effect you're going to see. If these are my solutes, all of these are going to cause the boiling point to go above 100. But this one is going to go the most above 100. All of these are going to cause the freezing point to drop below zero. This one is going to drop the furthest below zero. So let's look at this question. Which aqueous solution will have the highest boiling point? Do you remember the formula for this guy? Okay. It's a sugar. Does sugar dissolve in water? Absolutely, it does. When this dissolves in water, how many pieces will it fall apart into? Be careful. This isn't ionic. When a covalent solute dissolves, what is broken apart? Not these covalent bonds. Intermolecular forces. So guess what? This falls apart into just one piece. It stays as one piece. What about this guy, though? He falls apart into two pieces. And this one, three pieces. Which one is going to have the highest boiling point then? Letter C. Did you all notice? I didn't even look at these numbers. They don't even matter. A colligative properties question depends only upon how many pieces does it fall apart into. I'm going to say one more thing and then I will be quiet. On our test next week, guys, you're going to be asked this question right here. What has the highest boiling point or melting point? 
You're going to be asked that question a lot. You need to be very careful that you understand what is the situation. If it is comparing solutions, think colligative properties. Think number of particles, but what if they're not solutions like we did in chapters 11 and 12? What if you had these as options? What if I gave you those three? They're not solutions, just these compounds. Which one has the highest melting point? What are you breaking to melt this guy? Ionic. What are you breaking to melt this guy? Intermolecular forces? It's nonpolar, so what's the only force? What about this one? Does it have hydrogen bonding as well? Yeah, it does. Which of these is hardest to break? You got it. Did I think about number of particles? No, I didn't, because these aren't solutions. You've got to be really careful with that. And that is all.